Okay, good morning once again, and let me welcome you to today's webinar on climate action. If not now, then when? I am Leon Charles from Charles and Associates in Grenada, and I am your moderator for this event. When we look at the climate action being taken by countries around the world, I think we all know that to date, governments are failing to match the level of ambition required to meet the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degrees Celsius limit, the long-term temperature goal. And it is no secret that government's current commitment as expressed in the first nationally determined contributions, set the world on course for warming of, under, of about 2.8 degrees Celsius. Under the Paris Agreement, new and updated NDCs are due to be presented by the end of this year. And given the scale of the emissions reductions required as expressed in the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, incremental improvements to these plans will not be enough. Therefore, as this webinar seeks to explain, transformational changes, both at the global and sectoral levels are necessary to achieve the long-term temperature goal. Countries are now focused on designing COVID-19 recovery strategies, and these present both opportunities and threats for governments to enhance climate action and build resilience to climate change. This webinar is being presented by Climate Analytics, which is an international nonprofit climate science and policy institute with offices in Berlin, New York, Lomé, and Perth. It supports climate vulnerable countries with the latest scientific advice and undertakes extensive research related to the Paris Agreement 1.5 degree goal. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. And a couple of technical guidance points just as we get started. One, we want you to be aware that the webinar is being recorded. Um, you will be muted upon entry and video has been disabled. If you encounter technical issues, please submit your questions in the Q&A chat and our team will get back to you. And when we get to the question and answer section, we're asking you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A chat section, and our speakers will address them based on after the presentations are completed. So in terms of our program today, it's divided into two segments. The first segment will have a total of five presentations providing an overview of the scientific information on the topic. And then the second segment will be a Q&A session between the presenters and yourselves. The presentations, the five presentations, are going to be addressing a number of topics and they're on, the, on your screen. Can the Paris Agreement 1.5 limits still be met? The second one is how far are governments from meeting the 1.5 degrees Celsius target of the Paris Agreement? The third one, getting to net zero and beyond. The fourth one, what, what are the policy, economic, and technological levers that will help to set us on course for meeting the Paris goals? And the fifth one, how ambitious plans can set us on course for 1.5 degrees Celsius. Our presenters all come from climate analytics. Um, we have Bill Hare, who is the founder and CEO of Climate Analytics. He has contributed actively to the development of the international climate regime since 1989, including the negotiation of the 1992 UN Framework on Climate Change, the 1997 Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement in 2015. Our second presenter will be Deborah Ramalope from South Africa, who is an environmental scientist by training. She has experience from both sides of the aisle, having worked previously for the South African government and for the oil and gas industry. She is currently the team leader for policy analysis at Climate Analytics, focusing mainly on the qualitative aspects of climate policy. Our third speaker will be Claire Feisen, who is an environmental scientist and policy analyst who has worked for the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, analyzing the mitigation components of the NDCs. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Matthew Gidden, is classically trained as a nuclear engineer, and he has developed energy and climate change modeling, particularly during his tenure as a research scholar 
at the energy program of the International Institute of Applied Science Analysis. He is climate analytics team leader for mitigation pathway analysis, focusing mainly on the quantitative aspects of climate policies. Our fifth speaker will be Dr. Ursula Fuentes Hotfilter, who is based in Perth, Western Australia, and conducts research on international climate po policy, focusing on the development of climate policy and energy transformation strategies, in particular in the Asia Pacific region. And our sixth speaker is Dr. Andres. Oshia, who is a senior climate policy analyst and climate analytics, with a particular focus on European energy and climate policy, as well as transition towards a low carbon economy. He also contributes to the Climate Action Tracker with qualitative and quantitative assessment of some of the big emitters climate policies, focusing mainly on the European Union. So that's your cast of speakers, a very impressive cast, if I may say so myself. And uh, without any further ado, we'll move on to the first presentation by Bill Hare. Can the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees Celsius limit still be met? Um, Bill, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Leon. And uh, good morning, uh, New York time. It's uh, sad not to be in New York for this event, but here we are in the world we're in now. So um, I just wanted to step through uh, to lead off on this uh, uh, webinar with uh, the question that I guess many are asking themselves is can the Paris Agreement's one and a half de uh, degree limit still be met? Uh, next slide, please, Hans. As we all know, uh, the Paris Agreement adopted a groundbreaking uh, long-term temperature goal in Paris in 2015, uh, reflecting a recognition by the global community that uh, the former two degree goal was insufficient to minimize the uh, damages that will flow from climate change. Uh, that uh, a limit in the Paris Agreement provides a framing for the mitigation analyses, the, uh, the means of getting to this limit that we'll be seeing later uh, in the webinar. The next slide. Half a degree warming um, really matters. Uh, that's one of the developments in the science in the last de decade has really shown that uh, uh, there's a very steep increase in the risk as you increase every increment of warming. Um, one and a half degrees already is at the outer edge of the historical experience of humanity, uh, and two degrees would be uh, uh, a new climate state, particularly uh, in the tropical re regions. Um, li limiting warming to one and a half degrees will uh, limit damages compared to two degrees, so a half the heat wave length, for example, uh, and nearly double the reduction in water availability that would otherwise occur in subtropical dry regions at two degrees. So overall, there was a very good basis for the Paris Agreement's temperature limit. Uh, the next slide, please, Hans. Um, the, the Paris Agreement limit is designed really to avoid the worst risks. Um, the uh, IPCC shows uh, quite clearly that uh, already at one and a half degrees, there are going to be significant uh, damages. Um, but the one and a half degree special report and subsequent science also shows uh, that the uh, task of reaching the limit is feasible in technical, economic, and sustainability terms. And in particular, it showed very clearly that uh, what is holding us back is, is a level of political commitment and action. It's also important to note that as we approach the uh, global warming level of one and a half degrees, um, we are going to uh, see uh, different parts of the world warm faster than others. Land will, will warm faster than oceans. And uh, when we reach, if we reach one and a half degrees uh, of warming above pre-industrial, uh, every other year, maybe just uh, above or below one and a half degrees. So exceeding one and a half degrees at any particular time or place uh, does not actually mean that the Paris Agreement long-term goal is violated, as I'll, I'll show in the next slide. So next slide, please. With the world warming, uh, we, we know that some regions are going to warm faster than others. I've already mentioned that land regions will, will uh, warm faster than oceans, but many land regions will warm faster than uh, others around them. And so that means that a warming of one and a half degrees above pre-industrial regionally uh, will occur in a number of regions significantly before the global mean warming, the Paris Agreement temperature goal reaches one and a half degrees. This differential warming is already accounted for in the global risk assessments that underpin uh, the Paris Agreement's one and a half degree limit. 
So that means that exceeding one and a half degrees at any particular time or place may not mean the Paris Agreement goal itself is, is broken. Next slide, please. Even at the present level of warming, which is actually about 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial, we will also see that some months in each year uh, will exceed one and a half degrees above the corresponding pre-industrial month. Uh, that's due to uh, natural fluctuations in global temperature on top of the underlying uh, global warming that's driving up the average warming. Again, these uh, monthly differences are also accounted for in the overall global risk assessments. The next slide, please. Now, as the world reaches or uh, approaches one and a half degrees, uh, that will uh, mean that natural fluctuations, natural variability in the climate system will cause some years to exceed this warming level and others to fall a bit below. So the, pro the probability of exceeding at one and, a half, uh, one and a half degrees in any given decade, for example, is already about going to be about 50%. The next slide, please. As, as we approach uh, one and a half degrees, and as I've mentioned, we're already at 1.1 degrees warming above pre-industrial, the frequency of global mean warming exceeding one and a half degrees in any given year will also increase. So by the time we uh, uh, get another 0.2 degrees warming at 1.3 degrees, for example, we can expect uh, one in 20 years uh, to be above, uh, above one and a half degrees. So our experience as we go forward even if successful in getting onto a Paris Agreement pathway, is that we're going to see some years uh, increasingly frequently exceeding uh, a global mean increase of one and a half degrees above the pre-industrial level. The next slide, please. At present, uh, for about one degree warming, if you look at the, the left hand, the blue um, uh, distribution in this figure, you see the chance of uh, a year exceeding uh, one and a half degrees at the present level of warming is really low. But within the next decade, uh, the chances of seeing a one and a half degree warming limit will increase relatively quickly. It could even be as high as, uh, as one in five, according to some estimates, given different assumptions about natural variability. If that happens, it won't mean that the Paris Agreement is busted. Uh, one would have to need, uh, need uh, to look at actually the emission pathway that we're on to work out uh, whether a, a, a pattern of exceedance of one and a half degrees means that we're really in trouble. The next paragraph, please. Oh, the next slide, uh, slide please. This is a, a figure showing a, a synthetic uh, temperature series, one where uh, superimposed on top of a one and a half degree pathway for global mean warming, uh, we put on top a random natural variability. So you can see even in some years, uh, around uh, the 2030s and 2040s, you could even be approaching 1.8 degrees warming above pre-industrial at one end of that range of variability. So next slide, please. And looking at the overall uh, emission pathways and, and what that means for global mean temperature, you see here's the set of pathways that were reviewed in the IPCC special report showing uh, uh, how there's quite a wide range of warming coming from the uh, 50 odd plus pathways uh, that the IPCC classified as one and a half degree compatible. And you can see that for a number of these, they exceed uh, one and a half degrees for a time. These are pathways with a low overshoot of about 0.1 degree. Um, and at present, exceeding one and a half degrees for a short period will occur in most of the one and a half degrees scenarios. Again, uh, that's just to emphasize that temporarily exceeding this one and a half degree level doesn't necessarily mean that the global uh, goal of the Paris Agreement is lost. Uh, next slide, please. Now, turning to the emission pathways, which we're going to be going through the consequences of very shortly in different ways. Uh, this is a, a figure now that on the left-hand side shows you the carbon dioxide uh, emission range of pathways for the IPCC one and a half degree compatible scenarios. You can see there's a significant band of emissions that come out of this diverse range of pathways, but most of them lead to uh, CO2 emissions approaching zero by mid-century. And that's where the pathway that's been called for internationally of reaching zero emissions by, uh, by 2050 is really coming from the knowledge that unless we get emissions down to this level to zero, warming will keep happening. Um, you also see, and this will be the subject of Claire Fison's talk, 
that once you get to zero emissions, there may be a need for significant negative emissions, depending on the, the ability to get emissions down faster, then you'll need less negative emissions. But if you go slower, you're gonna need much deeper emissions. So next slide, please. Now, just to frame uh, the discussions that we'll be having in the next uh, section of this pre presentation, this uh, figure gives you an insight into the, uh, the sector transformations that would, uh, are necessary to underpin the one and a half degree transition. Driving them all is the shift to renewable electricity. Uh, renewable e electricity is essential to enable other sectors to decarbonize. And that means uh, decarbonizing the power sector means we need to be out of coal by around 2040 uh, with a very large buildup of renewable energy over a short period of time. Transport needs to be electrified, industry needs to be electrified, and as we'll see, uh, other energy sources such as green hydrogen will need to be sourced uh, at scale. I, I won't go through all of these, but the point is that in order to get to one and a half degrees, uh, we need a really full transformation of all of the energy related sectors, including a significant amount of action in the land sector to take up carbon uh, in, in forests and soils. We have to look at the whole picture and the, uh, we can't avoid action in any single area. So next slide, please. And this leads into uh, the next pre presentation from Deborah. Deborah, over to you. Thanks, Bill. Um, so yeah, you, you've heard about the probability of exiting 1.5 degrees, the importance of meeting it and the risks and impacts of missing it. So my part of the presentation is going to focus on what governments are doing basically to, to meet the 1.5 temperature goal. Um, and I have a few countries, basically some of the good guys and some of the bad guys, um, just to give you a flavor of what's happening in terms of the commitments that some of the countries are making. So this slide basically shows that, I mean, as we all know, 2020 is the year full of expectations. Um, expectations in terms of the world basically expecting that countries should be submitting uh, ambitious targets. Um, and I'm saying the, they are expected to submit ambitious targets because we are now nine months into, into the year and we're still hopeful that in the next three months we're going to get more um, submissions. Next slide, uh, Hans. So what are the current uh, uh, state of play? Um, there's very little action by countries. As you look at this map, this map basically shows the countries that have updated their indices. The majority of those not ambitious. Um, there are countries who have submit, resubmitted their old indices. There are countries that have already announced that they will not be updating their indices. The map also gives a summary of um, who, who has submitted an ambitious target and who has submitted an unchanged target. You have countries like Japan, for instance, that have submitted an unchanged target, although they have mentioned that they will be submitting a more ambitious um, NDC next year. And you can get the details. We have the details of, of all the countries. We do an analysis of both old and new indices on our on the CAD website. But overall, the current state of play shows we are at risk of slipping out of the first agreement um, uh, goal. Next slide, uh, Hans. So the thermometer shows the temperature implications of current policies and targets. Um, the bar on the right shows that the implementation of current policies will, will lead to 2.9 degrees temperature rise by the end of the century. This is 0 0.1 lower than the last assessment that we did. Uh, before Madrid in December 2019, which was done by the CAT. As you can see, this is definitely not enough. Um, and the bar on the left shows the impact of current indices or pledges that have been made by countries. And this will lead to warming of 2.7 degrees by end of the century. And now with the recent an announcement from China, um, although it's not reflected in this thermometer, um, we expecting a further 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees less, which will land us at around 2.4 to 2.5 uh, degrees. So I guess this is, this is basically painting a sovereign picture in terms of where we're heading with the current indices and targets and policies that countries have committed to and are currently implementing domestically. Next slide, 
Okay, in addition to temperature implications, I thought I would share with you the 2030 emissions gap. This shows the expected absolute emission emissions in 2020, 2025, and 2030, and these are compared with benchmark pathways for, for meeting 1.5 uh, Paris Agreement goal. Just note that this is only for the countries that we, we track in the CAT. Um, important there, it's the green arrow on the right that shows a substantial gap. The, the gap is huge and it's not closing. Um, that's basically for 2020, 2030, we have a gap of between 23 to 27 gigatons that needs to be closed for us to be able to reach uh, 1.5 goal. And there are no surprises there given the, the type of targets that we have seen this year. We're expecting much more ambitious targets and clearly countries are not, are not, are not that ambitious. Um, next slide, um, Hans. Okay, moving on to the country examples, uh, starting with China. This is the domestic emissions reduction pathway um, for China, um, and it shows various temperature levels, but most importantly, showing how far their current NDC target and policies are for 1.5 pathways. It's, it's not close. Um, however, the recent announcements by China signals good intentions on, on, on China's government's part. Um, the, the announcement to update its NDC for emissions to peak before 2030 and reach carbon neutrality before 2060, it's, it's definitely groundbreaking, um, given the, the, the size of the country and the emission levels that, that, uh, uh, that we get from, from China. And that definitely gives us hope. Um, I think it revives hope in the, in the climate change space. Also, China is one, one country that had uh, green interventions um, uh, included in the recovery packages. Um, uh, unlike many countries that are basically rolling back um, their policies that have continued to invest in fossil fuels, China has some interventions. Um, yes, they still have fossil fuel interventions included in the recovery package. However, there's, there's also a few green recovery uh, packages. So what is important, I think, for China now um, is to strengthen and increase its level of action to bring down its emissions. And as is the case with global emissions, China's non-CO2 emissions will take considerably longer to bring down to zero than its CO2 emissions. Um, and the picture is not only good, there's some challenges, I think, in the Chinese policy, uh, which would require urgent attention for China to be consistent with 1.5 pathway. And the big question is the, the continued support for coal, uh, both domestically and uh, in other countries. Um, that's something that they will have to tackle uh, quite urgently for them to be able to align to 1.5. Next slide, um, Hans. Okay, the USA, um, it's, as we look at the USA currently, it's definitely not heading in the right direction, but things could flip um, should Biden make it um, into, into the White House. I think the, most of you would have seen the Biden climate plan, which is another promising plan amongst what we are seeing now in terms of the recent announcement, the Chinese announcement. We've also had the EU announcement and you'll hear from Andrew when he gives a presentation on the EU that there's some signs of promises um, in this space. And uh, the Biden plan is it's another one uh, that could result in significant emission reductions. If you look at some of the components like the proposed 2035 targets, such as the 50% reduction in building sector emissions and the decarbonization of the power sector, that is massive. I think that would be huge in terms of the impact that those uh, interventions would have um, on, the, on the USA emissions and, and I think globally as well. But if you look at where the country is right now, it's definitely going in the opposite direction, uh, where there is systematic rollback of climate policies and, and the big one being the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Um, so yeah, the, the current path is definitely not great. Um, and this is also, the USA is also another country that did not use the opportunity by recovery packages um, to basically roll, roll out uh, green interventions but they have decided not to attach any strings um, of large, uh, to the large volumes of money um, uh, that they have, they have issued out uh, to different sectors of, of the economy. So that's another big picture there, but yeah, like I said, if, the, if Biden makes it, then the, his, his plan looks quite, quite brave. Next, next slide, Hans. Okay, Chile. Um, so the, this, 
this is one of the good news. I mean, there, there are countries, Chile is one of the good examples. Um, um, and, and one hopes that others can follow in Chile's example. It was one of the first countries that updated its NDC and it stands out from the rest. And, uh, it, and it, its updated NDC is also much more ambitious than the previous one. It has also indicated its emissions, uh, that its emissions will peak in 2025, and it also has committed to a carbon neutrality target by 20, uh, 2050. And some of, some of the good elements in its, in its NDC includes a target of 60% of renewables by 2035, and increasing that basically ramping up and, and scaling up to 70% by 2050. Um, it is also definitely working on its um, draft. They have a draft climate change law, um, which is quite important. Uh, as some of you may know that you can have all the best targets and the best ambitious uh, targets and plans if you don't have the, the legislation to empower you to implement some of these things that basically gives you teeth uh, to be able to, 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 to achieve your, your targets. That's quite critical, I think, and we expect that this is going to, to empower Chilean Im implementers um, in going forward and implementing their, their policy. And, and lastly, Chile plans to base out coal in 2040, although it's not aligned. I mean, in the piece of work that we did in, 20, in 2019 on coal phase out, uh, Latin American countries need to phase out coal in 2032. However, globally, we're looking at 2040. And that's, that's what Chile is aiming for, 2040 for, for, for emission, uh, for coal phase out um, in the country. That's the target they've set for themselves. Next, next slide, Hans. Um, so the next two countries are some of the worst performers in the climate change space. Um, um, and those are Australia, and then the next one will be uh, Russia, starting with Australia. So Australia has no intention to update its 2030 target. It has also rejected adopting a net zero and renewable energy targets. This is also a country that lacks climate policy uh, direction. So there's no national uh, climate policy direction in the country to, to guide the pathway uh, that should be aligned to 1.5. And it also continues to invest in fossil fuels, especially gas, and continue to support coal as well. And we have seen that reflected also in the recent uh, recovery package, which also missed the opportunity to, to invest in low carbon investments. So the recovery package is mainly dominated by, it's, or it's led by gas. Um, and basically pursuing a pathway that's going to lock them in, in carbon in the future, in the medium to long term going forward. And, and there's no current indications that shows that the situation will improve anytime soon. Next slide, Hans. Uh, Russia, as I've indicated, that it's, it's also another bad one, not so good. As you can see in the graph, both its current policies and indices are nowhere near aligning to the 1.5 pathway. It is in, and it is also one of the fourth, um, it is the fourth largest emitter and its emissions are still rising and will continue to increase under the current NDC. If you ask me if there's any hope, sadly the answer is no. Um, there is no hope. For example, including the, the, the new policies that have come out, they continue to to promote the use of fossil fuels. Um, and an example there is there's a new policy on, on energy, uh, which is basically a strategy for 2035. And, and that strategy also um, continues the, the promotion of, of fossil fuels and expansion both domestically and um, internationally in their export markets. Um, the next slide, Hans. Okay. Um, so this is, this is about the project that we are implementing as climate analytics supported by IKEA. It is about supporting 68 countries. Um, as, as you may know that the, there are gaps in the, in the analysis space. Um, as, as you know, there are global and regional peace agreement compatible pathways published and are available to, for everyone to use, but these are not necessarily available for most countries. Um, and this project is basically about providing those uh, uh, pathways for 68 countries. So the intention here uh, and the plan, and we've started working on it, it's a three-year 
project um, is to produce 1.5 national ancestral pathways for the 68 countries. And if you look at the map there at the bottom, it basically shows the, the blue parts. It, it, that's the countries that we will be covering under the, the IKEA project. And we think this would be useful resource for many stakeholders and policymakers, basically, particularly for those countries that don't have the capacity um, to do their own analytical work. And it would be mainly useful in the development and updating of the indices. We have noted that the COVID may have delayed um, the, the submission of indices and low emissions development strategies in some countries. And I think some of the pieces of work as we, we get them finalized will be useful for, for strengthening and assisting in the analytical work for those countries, particularly for the indices and the long-term strategies. Uh, and in also helping countries to come up with their own national goals, emission reduction goals, um, including your net zero uh, emission goals um, for, for many countries in general. And then the, the last part on the slide is basically to, to highlight the sustainable development benefits that could be realized by implementing low carbon interventions. I think these are just non-brainers and there's a lot of research that basically highlights the benefits that, that countries can, can get out of implementing low carbon interventions in the country and those range from air quality, um, and you may have seen recently that we've been seeing reports that many countries are basically, or cities in particular, are celebrating the quality of, uh, of air that they have uh, seen in some cities due to COVID impacts where the emissions were low and therefore the improvement in air quality. So that's one key benefit, which also impacts the, the health budgets of, of many countries. The other one is the creation of jobs. Um, and the, the other one that I can highlight is the energy security and independence. And this one is it's another important one for many countries, um, particularly those without their own supply of primary energy, as it reduces the cost and burden of dependence on, on for instance, fuel imports in, into, the, crown, into the, the country. And all this, um, and this is not an ex exhaustive list, uh, all this, definitely have, have a way of contributing to general economic growth in, in many countries. And there's many examples and case studies where we've seen the benefits of socioeconomic um, um, benefits that one gets from low emission development interventions. I think that's it from me for now. Thanks. Over to Claire. Great, thanks Deborah. Um, so, as Deborah noted, um, a number of countries such as Chile and China are coming forward with carbon neutrality or net zero targets. Um, and so we thought it's a good moment now to look at what does net zero or carbon neutrality um, mean? Um, and how do, we, how do our actions over the next decade really affect what we'll have to do in the future to reach net zero and ultimately to get to net negative um, beyond that? So uh, next slide, Hans, thank you. So let's just start quickly with um, an example of a Paris Agreement compatible emissions pathway for limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Here you can see total net greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that they, these drop very rapidly. So over the next decade, they, they drop by 45% from 2010 levels. And then we get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by around 2070, and they go into the net negative beyond that. So what's this pathway made of? Well, we have um, CO2 emissions. So in the dark gray, you can see direct CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and industry. In the green um, positive emissions there, you can see um, CO2 from agriculture, forestry, and land use. Um, and then in the pale gray, you can see non-CO2 emissions from, for example, agriculture, waste, and industry. But we also have removals. Um, so in the next slide, um, you can see two broad categories of removal. So we have what, what are often called more nature-based options um, from forestry and land use and agriculture in the green. And then there are more technological options. So an example here is um, com combining a bioenergy plant with carbon capture and storage, but there are other, other solutions are sort of in early stages of development. And these are collectively called carbon dioxide removal. And because of this carbon dioxide removal, um, in the next slide, you can see that if we actually plot only CO2 emissions, these hit net zero earlier than our total greenhouse gas emissions would hit net zero. So CO2 emissions get to net zero around the middle of the century. Um, and it's important to note here that this timing would creep forward if we were to fall short on our near-term emissions reductions. 
Um, it's also important to note that this is just one exemplary scenario, but actually the IPCC found in their um, recent special report on 1.5 degrees that really all model pathways that limit warming to 1.5, as Bill also showed, require some amount of carbon dioxide removal. And that's because despite our best efforts, um, there will be some emissions that are more difficult to eliminate, such as those in the agriculture sector, um, but also because we've frankly been too slow so far, we've, we've sort of got to got to make up some time. Um, so in the next slide, um, it's worth pausing here to consider what does net zero actually mean and what are its, its limitations as a target in some ways. Um, so net zero was really enshrined in the Paris Agreement as a balance between emissions and removals of all greenhouse gases. So it's not just CO2, it's all greenhouse gases in the context of the Paris Agreement. That's an important distinct, distinction from carbon neutrality, which refers to um, net zero of, of carbon dioxide alone. And that, as we saw in the earlier, um, in the earlier graph, um, needs to hit zero earlier. Um, now, globally, the timing of net zero is really important because it affects the timing at which we reach peak warming. So the earlier that we hit net zero, the earlier temperature stops rising. Um, at the domestic level, though, the timing of net zero will vary between countries, so it will depend on um, the speed with which different countries can reduce their emissions and the speed at which they can ramp up removals. So if we need to get to global net zero around mid-century or shortly afterwards, then um, that means that some countries will have to hit net zero earlier. And it's really important to note here that net zero is really only a milestone um, on the way to net negative. It's, it's, it's not an end point. And that's important because we know that there are limits to how much carbon removal that we can actually achieve within sustainability constraints. So fundamentally, we need to get absolute emissions down as low as possible to limit the amount of carbon removal that we ultimately end up needing. And that means that understanding the actual trajectories of emissions and removals over time is really important. And in the next slide, yeah, um, already ahead of me, um, what's clear when you look at different trajectories for limiting warming to 1.5 is that the level of near-term ambition is really crucial for determining how much carbon removal we'll need over the century. Um, in this graph, you can see four points. These are four different illustrative pathways from the IPCC special report. Um, and each pathway, you can see the amount of carbon removal that is required. And the, the three in blue there are compatible with the Paris Agreement. They limit warming to 1.5 with only a limited overshoot at maximum, whereas the red dot there is not compatible with the Paris Agreement. Well, what's clear is that the, um, the less ambitious we are in the near term, so the higher our emissions are in 2030, as shown on the x-axis, the more cumulative CDR we'll need over the century. And also the more we'll be reliant um, on, we'll need to go beyond um, terrestrial and nature-based options towards more technological um, carbon dioxide removal options. And it's worth for reference here pointing out that orange area on the right-hand side of the graph, which shows where the current nationally determined pledges um, under the Paris Agreement would take us. So clearly um, setting us up for an unmanageable level on, of carbon removal. Um, so that's at the global level. If we then switch to the next slide, um, we can think about the um, national level. What, what do different countries need to do in terms of carbon removal? What is their responsibility? Um, now at the moment, we mainly rely on models to understand the global need for carbon removal. And these distribute carbon removal around the world based on where it's cheapest to deploy it. But that isn't necessarily the fairest way of doing things. So we took a look at what would happen if we use different um, burden sharing schemes to distribute the carbon removal burden between countries. And you can see in these two plots um, on the left, um, a, a distribution scheme based on responsibility for causing climate change. So those countries with more historical cumulative emissions per capita get a greater share of the carbon removal burden. And on the right-hand side, um, we use ability to pay. So countries with a larger GDP um, at different points in time get a larger share of the burden. And you can see that there's a very different distribution when these equity schemes are applied. And the larger emitters in the larger countries like the US, China, and the EU all get a much larger share. So in some cases, a two to three times larger CDR burden over the century when we consider these um, equity schemes. Um, and in the next slide, um, similar to the, the global level, we can actually look at how um, these national burdens of carbon removal uh, increase if there is a delay in near-term emissions reductions. 
So you can see in these graphs on the x-axis um, for each country the emissions level in 2030 and on the y-axis the corresponding um, fair share of carbon removal over the century. And for the larger emitters um, and the larger countries it's, there's, a, there's a clear relationship where each, uh, the more that we delay our emissions reductions, every one gigaton of emissions that is released in 2030, um, the more carbon removal burden we get over the century. So, so that one gigaton of emissions in 2030 could generate 20 to 70 gigatons of fair share carbon removal burden over the course of the century. And it follows that the emissions level in 2030 implied by the current NDCs would actually leave a huge carbon removal burden for future generations in these countries. So more than 100 gigatons of carbon removal for China, the US and the EU. And these are likely impossible to achieve without compromising sustainable development at that scale. So we then took a look at what happens if these countries were to really enhance their ambition, if they were to do what's sort of at the global level, we need to um, half the NDC um, implied emissions levels. So if, if each of those countries and regions were to do that, and you can see a substantial drop of over 100 gigatons um, of, of carbon removal burden for each of these countries. And to get, give you an idea of what that means, um, for China, the upper range there is about 40 years worth of current CO2 emissions. For the US, the upper range is 50 years worth. And for the EU, it's 30 years worth of current CO2 emissions. So really big numbers there. And these show how important it is for governments to really consider the cleanup bill that today's children will inherit if the NDCs are not substantially ramped up. Um, and in the next slide, you can just a little plug for, we've got a guest post in the carbon brief um, and a paper out if you want to find out more about that work. So um, my final slide is on um, the governance challenges that are associated with this need for um, potentially scaling up CDR to a large level. Um, we know that carbon removal really isn't a magic bullet. It comes with serious sustainability challenges if deployed at larger scales. And some nature-based options actually become less effective at higher temperatures, for example, because of increasing numbers and intensities of forest fires and storms causing the re-release of carbon. So um, really rapidly reducing emissions must be the priority here. And carbon removal should not be in any way an excuse to keep on emitting. And that means it will be really important to keep track of where we are and whether, whether we're on track to, um, for, for limiting warming to 1.5. And a key challenge here is that many of the current targets, the NDCs and long-term strategies that have been brought forward are unclear about the role of removals. Um, and they often imply an equivalence between emissions reductions and removals. But we know that there are significant uncertainties and risks of, imp of impermanence, among other challenges, which actually mean that removals cannot be simply seen as emissions in reverse. And so therefore, we, we really need to see targets that clearly indicate distinct roles for emissions reductions and removals, especially where nature-based options with, with higher uncertainties are involved. Um, another challenge is that um, targets may not be what they actually say they are. So some, in some cases, tricky accounting rules or the exclusion of some sectors or gases can make targets seem more ambitious than they actually are. And then another potential confounding factor is that rules haven't yet been agreed for whether and how removals could be transferred under the Paris Agreement market mechanisms for use towards national targets. So really we need um, systems in place that would avoid the double counting of removals by more than one entity and to ensure that only removals that are permanent and are additional and really readily measurable um, can be transferred. And finally, um, given the sustainability constraints faced by a number of carbon removal options, um, we really need to understand the context in which different carbon removal options could be combined and safely deployed. And we need to develop governance mechanisms for minimizing potential um, trade-offs with sustainable development. Um, and we've got, I've just put a picture of a paper that we did in 2018, which we're currently updating. So check out our website for updates on that. And with that, I'll hand over to Matt. Thanks so much, Claire. And I'll ask for your forgiveness that, that my camera is not working here. Um, so, so Claire just outlined um, uh, sort of what it means uh, from a political reality standpoint to get to net zero, also from an equity perspective. I want to talk a little bit about um, the characteristics of scenarios that, that get us there from a policy, technology, and economy perspective. Um, so next slide, please. And let's continue on to, uh, to the next indeed. So one of the key 
observations we make from, from assessing the scenarios uh, that have been submitted to the IPCC and the SR15, um, uh, there are a few key messages. So if we first think about coal use in these scenarios, um, it's very clear that uh, for scenarios that meet the Paris Agreement, uh, coal use needs to peak uh, effectively immediately and drastically reduce um, such that there is effectively uh, zero coal use in the OECD by 2030 um, and coal is phased out by 2040. And these numbers don't change very much if we think about a two degree limit rel relative to the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Agreement. So this is a very clear message in, in all scenarios that, that we assess and that are assessed by the IPCC in order to meet the Paris Agreement. Um, but there's, if we go to the next slide, um, there are, uh, is a lot of discussion about uh, the role of gas as a bridging fuel. Um, and so one of the activities we've been uh, uh, undertaking this year is, is sort of looking into the role of gas, especially within these scenarios that, that meet the sustainability limits um, uh, as, the, as assessed by the scientific community that also meet the Paris Agreement. So here on the left-hand side, uh, we're showing you the median of, of Paris Agreement compatible pathways uh, for unabated gas use. That's gas without CCS. Um, and we actually see a number of characteristics that, that uh, are consistent between coal and gas. Uh, first of all, globally, gas consumption in these scenarios peaks in 2020. There's some regionality differences as, as a, there's a slight delay in Asia to, for peaking in 2030. But largely, we see the same characteristics, drastic reductions in uh, gas consumption. And by 2050, uh, uh, only a small fraction of gas is used uh, in total energy supply in these scenarios, uh, much smaller than today. Um, if we go to the next figure, Hans. Um, and indeed, uh, one of the questions that, that we asked ourselves this year is, um, uh, is our institutional scenarios, specifically with respect to the question of, of gas consumption, are they consistent with the scientific literature and with uh, scenarios that, that are assessed by the IPCC? And so if we look, for example, at uh, scenarios that are investigated by the International Energy Agency, in the past, they, they produced a beyond two degree scenario. Uh, they recently uh, updated their sustainable development scenario. And if we plot uh, gas use against uh, the, the range of pathways um, provided in the SR15, uh, we see, especially in the near term, uh, pretty much a, a large increase in gas use. So rather than peaking globally in 2020, in these scenarios, gas use peaks around 2030 instead and is still relatively high, so about the same levels as today, even by 2040. Um, so this leads us to, to, to question whether actually the, um, these are, are good scenarios. And in fact, we would, we would assess these are not good scenarios to use uh, when it comes to looking to uh, Paris Agreement compatible global gas consumption. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, there's, there's a bit of a, of a fly in the ointment here when we talk about fossil fuels in these scenarios, and that's, that's the heavy use of CCS in a lot of the scenarios. Um, so, so many of these scenarios that do have fossil fuels uh, still uh, remaining to a large extent uh, beyond the next couple of decades uh, do so because they have a very high reliance on uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And that's due largely to, to assumptions in these models that, that basically assume that CCS facilities will, will scale up um, relatively cheaply and, and will be a cost competitive uh, uh, option relative to uh, other power generation technologies. And frankly, what we're seeing today doesn't, doesn't really follow through with that. So at the moment, there's 21 large scale CCS facilities of which only two uh, up until a few months ago uh, were uh, connected to power stations. And one that was in the US, the Petronova plant, uh, just outside of Houston, has recently been mothballed. And this is largely due to the fact that CCS, uh, in this case, is, is being utilized with enhanced oil recovery rather than direct storage underground. And with falling gas prices uh, uh, and, uh, and falling prices doing, uh, due to renewable electricity, it's simply not economical to maintain the, the plant. And so investors who, who invested in the CCS retrofit at Petronova are, are effectively losing out. Um, and these are due not only to economics, um, or, or largely I should say to economics, because for, for CCS to be economical at these power stations, they really need to be running at a 90% capacity factor so that they're basically sucking out enough CC, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere to be economic and, and if, 
we're not running the power plant itself, then we won't be sucking CCS or carbon out of the atmosphere. So this leads us to believe that, that um, overall CCS likely isn't going to be an option uh, or a strong option in the, in the near future. If we go to the next slide. Um, so one of the main activities we've undertaken at Climate Analytics um, uh, under the Climate Action Tracker is, a, is an assessment of, uh, of what different sectors need to do to be Paris Agreement compatible over the next few decades. And as Bill mentioned in his, in his uh, first presentation, there's a clear message in the power sector and the power sector needs to, to rapidly decarbonize and to de completely decarbonize um, by 2050. Uh, and this means having uh, a vast majority uh, share of renewable electricity, 98 to 100% by 2050, um, which comes with it a number of, uh, uh, of issues that need to be addressed, but which, which have uh, technical capability to do so. Um, and, and one of the main sort of themes in this presentation is about the, um, the codependence of a lot of these mitigation mechanisms. So we'll be talking about storage We'll be talking about um, novel fuel synthetic hydrogen, uh, sorry, hydrogen and synthetic gas, and then also demand side measures, uh, uh, load balancing, et cetera. Um, if we go to the next slide. So what's one of the clear messages that, that um, comes out of our analysis in, in this um, uh, sector benchmark study is, is about the, the need really for all of these sectors to, to decarbonize in tandem. So if we look across sectors, if we look at industry, um, uh, the electrification of, of industry, about the move of uh, steel and cement to novel fuels and, and new technology methods, um, with uh, transportation, both freight and passenger electrifying or using new, tech, uh, new fuels, uh, there's a clear message, which is that basically we need not only um, strong electrification across sectors, uh, new technologies to be developed, um, but really, and, and where the synergies are is, is in the generation of new and novel fuels uh, from zero carbon uh, production mechanisms. And these include not only hydrogen through green hydrogen, but also synthetic fuels, ammonia, and others. Um, and these can, can power not only industry, but also our international shipping and aviation sectors as well. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Um, and so there's an open question or, or people, people question, um, how, how are these sort of changes enabled? And, and really it's through, it's through cost competitiveness. So if we look at even recent market trends, um, if we look at uh, variable renewables uh, across either onshore, offshore wind, uh, solar rooftop PV, concentrated solar power, uh, uh, not only are the existing sort of technical assessments through IRENA and LAZA uh, already showing cost competitiveness with fossil fuels. We see recent projects are actually outperforming even what um, analysts are, are estimating would be their levelized cost of electricity. So renewables are already outperforming um, uh, competitors such as fossil fuels. Uh, if we go to the next slide, what's actually really exciting is that um, these, these are uh, sort of, it, there are other technologies that together with renewable power generation can, can enhance our, our, our deep mitigation potential. And here we're highlighting hydrogen as, as one option. So on the top right figure, we're looking at different um, scenarios of hydrogen consumption with respect to uh, their uh, reduced emissions or mitigation potential. And there's, there's a pretty clear sort of correlation that high mitigation scenarios are starting, uh, or in the scenario literature, are starting to pick up hydrogen fuel as a, as a key technology in order to mitigate. And one of the really interesting things about hydrogen is it really, it will create a new kind of energy market. So at the bottom right, we're showing you uh, one study that's looking at um, the hydrogen market uh, under a high demand future, where there are really, there are a number of new players. So if we look at, for example, um, uh, exporters here include South America, Patagonia, include Africa, other developing nations. Um, Middle East, for example, with high solar potential uh, can be a, a net green hydrogen exporter, replacing their fossil fuel exports. And then even other sort of laggard countries like Australia have strong renewable potentials, which would allow them to be a strong hydrogen exporter. If we go to the next slide, um, and really where this comes together is when we look at um, producing these novel fuels um, with renewable energy. So at the moment, if we look at case studies in Germany and Texas, um, uh, in this paper, we, we show, or the authors show rather that 
based on best case or uh, uh, the best assumptions on on uh, sort of transition costs. Uh, that in basically in the in the coming decade, uh, green hydrogen will start to outcompete fossil fuel based hydrogen. So this is really where the the new mitigation technologies will start to flip on, um, uh, simply from a cost perspective, uh, not not considering other policies that sort of enhance um, their cost competitiveness. So if we go to the next slide. Um, and then, and then the final slide. So, so in this presentation, we've talked a lot about um, sort of what are key characteristics of Paris Agreement compatible scenarios. What are new technologies that will enable such a such a, um, a tr an energy transition? And and really key in all of this is 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 investment and new investments. And um, one of the things that we looked at at Climate Analytics and part of the Climate Action Tracker is uh, given the unique situation that we're in. Uh, do we have, um, we're, we're making a lot of investments. We're um, stimulating economies at present in order to rebound from, from the current pandemic and the economic downturn. And one of the main findings that, that, that we have if we compare available um, stimulus packages with the scenario literature on what um, investments are needed, we find that with a strong green stimulus, which is well within available stimulus package values, we can get well on our way to the investments needed for one and a half degrees. Whereas if we, um, if, if economies double down, subsidize fossil fuels and, and keep them afloat, we can actually rise beyond what we had projected under current policies pre COVID. So really this is a time of action. This is a time where we have the opportunity to invest in the technologies that will enable the transition to one and a half degrees. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll move on to Andre. Yes, uh, thank you, Matt. So uh, this presentation will present two cases uh, where we do have uh, moves in the right direction, and that will be European Union and South Korea. I will start with the European Union, uh, where quite a lot happened and it's moving in the right direction. It's not yet aligned uh, to Paris Agreement, but it's going there. So just starting with uh, the process that started in, in December last year, when the European Commission uh, presented uh, 11 days after it came into office, uh, the European Green Deal with three main elements, uh, the goal of climate neutrality and uh, a calendar indicating changes to the legislation that would allow the EU to get to reach this goal in the first place. Um, that also, this, this plan also included um, presentation of European climate law that uh, will enshrine this um, climate plan into uh, this uh, climate neutrality goal in European legislation and will allow the commission to actually set the pathway after 2030 to getting to climate neutrality. Just two days later, obviously that's been discussed before, uh, the heads of states, um, the European Council agreed to, agreed to this goal. All member states supported the climate neutrality goal. Just one country, Poland, said it will, it is not ready to implement this goal. However, it is surprising because it will not much have choice. Quite, quite many of those policies will have to be adopted with qualified majority anyway. And um, now it's also decided that countries which will not implement this objective will not have full access to the EU funding uh, for just transition, for example. Uh, in March, European Commission presented the proposal of the climate law um, and uh, if adopted, it's still a proposal, it still needs to be adopted by the council and by the parliament. Um, the commission will be given the right to uh, come up with the pathways and that means with the goals uh, for 2035, 24, 2045. Um, the placeholder for 2030 was filled with uh, the plan that the commission will present uh, impact assessment of the 2030 um, goal with uh, either 50 or 55 percent emissions reduction. This happened uh, exactly last week when the commission um, presented um, its, its, its goal, but uh, just towards on the climate neutrality, the issue with uh, what was presented in December, uh, there were main, two main issues. First of all, the climate neutrality, as uh, already Claire mentioned, is not, com is not the same as full decarbonization, as reducing emissions um, by 100%. The EU um, presented two scenarios which would result in climate neutrality um, and they would reduce emissions by up to 91 to 94% if carbon removal is included and the rest would be covered by little CF sync. Also, another issue with the pathways that would take the EU to the climate neutrality was uh, 
delaying action after 2030. So you can see that uh, 2020s would actually be lost decade. Uh, it's actually, uh, in this case, Commission didn't have the prerogative to deal with 2030 back then, actually. So uh, it had to stick to this at least 40% emission reduction that was um, adopted. And only recently, only last week, the EU recovered uh, or um, mitigated this issue uh, by presenting the plan to increase its emission action goal for 2030. Next slide. Here you can see namely that uh, the heel disappeared, so that the emission action is much more constant uh, and that uh, there will be some effort also in the 2020s. Um, so the EU increased uh, the, the proposal, uh, the, the European Commission's proposal, increased the emission action goal from the current at least 40% to at least 55%. However, this um, goal also includes the carbon sink in the Lulu CF, which actually weakens this goal by uh, slightly over 2%. So this means 52.8% emission reduction, depending on what the sink will be in 2030, actually. Intra-EU aviation and intra-EU maritime will be included in this target, in this goal. Uh, Intra-aviation was already included. And there's the ambition to also include extra-EU aviation and extra-EU uh, maritime, which would require strengthening this goal by additional 3%, because the emissions um, in those two sectors uh, increase much faster than uh, in the other sectors. And uh, overall, however, although the 2050 goal did not change because it was adopted in December last year, uh, this more ambitious 2030 goal um, reduces the total amount, amount of emissions uh, between now and 2050. Obviously, we need to go further and faster, but uh, this would also need increasing the share of renewables in the energy mix to 38.5% and reducing energy consumption to levels lower, uh, lower than, than initially planned. Next slide. And uh, also the Commission suggested new policy architecture uh, to reach this goal. So currently European policy, um, climate policy framework has two pillars, that's emissions trading, EU ETS, and uh, which covers power and industry. And what's not covered in the EU ETS, it's uh, mainly transport, buildings and services. Uh, that's the effort sharing regulation, uh, which is, uh, dividing the effort uh, between member states, and it's always very tough negotiations. The commission suggested moving um, the combustion or the emissions from combustion to the EU ETS. However, the regulations um, and the standards would still be kept uh, and strengthened even for transport sector. So um, this would um, make EU ETS much bigger and also transfer some powers to the European Commission, something that some member states may have issues with. And the Commission also suggested creating a new sector from agriculture and LUCF, um, where these two sectors would, to some degree, counterbalance each other. The emission sinks from LUCF with emissions from agriculture. And in addition to this, uh, farmers would have an incentive uh, to contribute to negative emissions as well. Next slide. So uh, where does it take us in terms of compatibility with uh, the Paris Agreement pathway. So the 2050 goal um, is actually climate neutrality, but uh, it also using uh, loose CF to get to 100%. Without loose CF, it's um, emissions reduction by 91 to 94%, including the carbon removal. Um, and still, you see that's a range. Uh, it's because this relies on two emission pathways suggested in the impact assessment, uh, which are considered compatible with the Paris Agreement but still how do we get to this 100% or to climate neutrality um, or emissions neutrality depends on what is the share of emissions reduction, of emissions uh, removal and of LULUCF, uh, something that needs to be further specified. For the 2030 goal, uh, we have at least 52.8% uh, emission reduction excluding LULUCF. We do have the resources, at least quite a big part of them, in the green, um, in, in the framework uh, of recovery, the climate target, which aims at spending at least 30% of the European multi-annual uh, budget uh, between 2021 and 2027, and the recovery fund, also 30% of those resources should be spent on achieving the climate neutrality goal and the 2030 goal. So the resources are there and quite some uh, of those resources should be spent in the coming three years. Uh, so until 2023. So a lot will be happening in the EU in the coming years. Over to Ursula.
Thank you, Andre. I will briefly introduce um, where uh, we stand and how we have analyzed uh, pathways for South Korea. Next slide, please. South Korea um, uh, is a country where emissions are increasing, have increased um, strongly in the past with a growing economy and growing energy demand and increasing emissions in particular from energy and industry. Um, and Korea, um, um, as we have analyzed, is, is currently not on track to achieve its uh, NDC target, um, which is defined uh, as a reduction against the business as usual pathway as an overall uh, target and includes also um, a contribution um, that is um, supposed to be realized domestically. Now, Korea has a set of uh, policies already implemented and also um, a political goal uh, um, uh, based on existing targets, discussions about um, increasing these uh, um, targets for renewable energy are ongoing and also an objective to reduce reliance uh, on nuclear energy, but also on coal both uh, 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 for contribution uh, to emission reductions and um, reducing air pollution. And very encouragingly, with the announcement of the Green New Deal um, in July this year, um, there's also a, a strength and support for renewable energy, for hydrogen, for electric vehicles, and ongoing discussions about um, um, moving towards a net zero target, uh, mid-century net zero target, um, and uh, instruments to achieve this. Now, uh, we have analyzed in a report, uh, next slide please, I won't go into the details um, uh, in the interest of time, you can uh, read this in the reports that we have published um, uh, recently. Um, so we have analyzed um, similar to what uh, Deborah presented for, uh, for other countries, um, uh, what would a pathway be for South uh, Korea uh, in line with a Paris Agreement, in line with a, uh, a pathway to, to net zero emissions that is consistent with a 1.5 uh, limit? What would be a domestic emission reduction pathway consistent with these global least cost pathways um, that have also been introduced by, uh, by Matt? And what we see is that um, these pathways imply uh, much faster reductions than uh, the, the, the target um, that South Korea has set itself. Um, and as we uh, again also see um, currently with current pr uh, policies, emissions are increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, now, next slide, we, uh, in our study, we have also compared uh, how this um, least cost pathway uh, uh, for Korea compares with um, an NDC target that uh, would be seen as a, as a fair share contribution um, uh, uh, for Korea uh, uh, compared uh, with un other countries. Uh, and what you see here is a, is a comparison uh, with a range, uh, with a fair share range um, that we develop with the Climate Action Tracker and where we rate countries according to uh, their fair share range and, and a fair share contribution uh, can be achieved with a domestic reduction and additional contributions to reductions elsewhere, typically for a country uh, in the OECD, um, such as Korea, South Korea. So, Next slide. Uh, uh, to summarize what we see in, in, in our analysis of where a target needs to be for Korea and where domestic reductions need to be, they need to be uh, reduced by uh, 49 uh, per percent um, compared to 2017. That's the historical uh, base here that the Korean government also uses. Um, and that is far more ambitious than the 19% reduction that the domestic component of South Korea's target currently uh, envisages. And this against uh, the backdrop of a currently still increasing emissions and projected uh, a projected increase in emissions. So this is what has been um, referred to today. Um, really, there needs to be a ratcheted up in, in the in the ambition and in climate policy uh, for Korea to get on a pathway towards net zero as it is um, uh, discussing um, currently. Now, 
what are these sectoral transformations? We have already heard a lot uh, today. I just want to highlight one, and this is uh, the next slide um, and the last one um, for South Korea, where we have analyzed uh, the transformation in the power sector, and in particular, the, um, the need to phase out coal. Uh, at a pace um, that is consistent with the Paris Agreement. So phasing out coal by 2030, as um, uh, Deborah and others have uh, already pointed out. And, and what you see here in black is where the emissions would take us with the current uh, coal-fired power stations, taking into account their age structure and taking into account already the political decision to retire them after 30 years. Um, and um, uh, in this context, um, there has been an announcement by Moon to, to uh, shut down a total of 30 uh, plants uh, by 2034. So this is already taken into account here, but the, the, there's a need to, to plan a faster phase out. Uh, unfortunately, um, against what is needed, um, there are still plans to even construct new, or there, there's still, uh, there are seven uh, coal generation units that are in the pipeline for construction. And this would add to the emissions burden um, or add to the stranded assets that are created because at some point um, there is a need to phase these out or, or reduce uh, the utilization much earlier than this envisaged uh, lifetime. So this is the key transformation that will help uh, reduce emissions fast at the time scale uh, that is needed, building on uh, enhanced renewable energy uptake and also building on uh, policies that are already, already existent, uh, including um, uh, development of a hydrogen strategy and opportunities for, for green hydrogen. So just as an example, uh, a country where still uh, uh, there's a lot to do and uh, an important focus needed for 2030, uh, but encouraging signs uh, in terms of uh, policies that are being discussed and in terms of the direction of, of a Green New Deal and uh, investments uh, into green technology. Now, uh, next slide. Um, Given that I'm the last presenter, um, I would uh, like to briefly highlight uh, what we think uh, the key messages are that we hope you can take away from um, all the presentations uh, that you have heard from uh, uh, my colleagues um, and myself. And, and the first one is uh, the critical message, uh, how important it is to um, achieve the Paris Agreement temperature goal, to limit warming to 1.5, to avoid the worst risk, but also importantly, that this is something that can be achieved, that still can be achieved. It's important to achieve it and we can achieve it. And how important it is to, to increase the ambition level for 2030. This is key to achieve those net zero targets that are in line with the Paris Agreement at the global scale, but also then for individual countries. And this is a transformational increase in ambition level that is needed, not just incremental. As we've heard, there are signs of hope, and this is really important. We have uh, had, um, uh, we've heard about the EU uh, in detail, the moves, uh, what is discussed in the EU, an important step in increasing the ambition level, and recently the announcement from China. And just these two countries together already cover 33%, a third of the global emissions. So um, these steps of increasing emission are really decisive and important. And there is hope, as we have seen, um, if there is a change in the US and Biden wins the election, um, announcements have been made uh, about the, the policy uh, and targets to be achieved, again, also towards net uh, zero. And these three emitters um, moving towards net zero by uh, mid-century um, cover already 45% of, of, uh, uh, of the global emissions. And uh, with, together with other um, countries, that, that would already cover more than uh, half of uh, global emissions uh, countries that would be uh, moving towards net zero by mid-century. Um, so this is really hopeful, and, and uh, we do hope that this uh, creates momentum for others to follow, because um, really we need everybody on board, and we need those NDCs uh, ratcheted up um, now. Next slide. And um, what we also hope uh, that you can take away uh, from these uh, uh, presentations you have heard is 
all these opportunities that we have with current developments, the opportunities for sustainable development, and the importance of long-term strategies to be developed also by 2020 uh, that can be used to achieve, to, to develop a strategy for each country uh, to achieve net zero emissions uh, by mid-century and enhance synergies with sustainable development and looking into how to manage those transitions in these, in these transformations uh, that are needed um, also at regional level uh, to keep employment and uh, sustainable development um, when transitioning from old uh, to new uh, industries. And um, from, as you have heard uh, from Claire, important to really seize those opportunities for transformations and for real reductions across all sectors to minimize the need for carbon removal, uh, because this would otherwise imply a large burden uh, and a, a huge cleanup bill um, that is not necessary because we have other options and we have those technologies that are developing um, that enable ambitious benchmarks to be achieved um, for to decarbonize the energy system, not only the power sector, but also end use sectors with uh, upscaling of renewable energy, storage technologies, electrification, green hydrogen, green fuels. Uh, Matt has outlined all these uh, um, fascinating and exciting technology developments um, that can be used. And this is, uh, of course, also at the heart of um, the investment shifts that are needed towards these technologies. And in the pandemic and in the crisis that we are all uh, in uh, this year, a strong green recovery, um, you can also take this message from the presentations, a strong green recovery and economic stimulus programs that that are used also to shift those investments and to add investments and stimulate investments into these clean uh, technologies, they can really help uh, not only addressing the pandemic and, and the economic crisis um, stemming from this, but also to enable those deep reductions that are needed to achieve the 1.5, uh, staying below 1.5 and uh, sustainable development goals. And with this, back to you, Leon. Okay, thank you very much and thank to all the speakers for some very informative presentations. Um, you've triggered quite a number of questions from the, from the audience, um, and I don't think we'll have time to address all of them, but probably a couple of quick ones in the time we have left. Um, starting with Bill, um, we have a question here, Bill. Uh, many thanks for the presentation. Does the model contemplate emissions that go beyond what humans emit? That is, does it take into account permafrost melting, volcanic eruptions, global fires, etc.? Uh, interesting question, Bill. Uh, would you care to share your thoughts on this? Yeah, good question. Um, and actually, the answer is um, yes and no. Um, the, the emission pathways that you see uh, to get to one and a half degrees and the carbon budgets um, to get there uh, do include some of these um, uh, issues, um, including uh, fires and so on built into the carbon cycle models. But uh, on the other side, uh, the pathways don't include uh, accounting for uh, permafrost melting. And what that means is that um, should there be significant uh, permafrost melting, larger CO2 emission reductions would be needed faster and unfortunately more negative emissions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Deborah, we have some people here from the least developed countries who are very interested in this. And the question we have here is, um, from the presentations, I understand that reaching 1.5 is possible if we take the right path. What of what has been shown today is applicable for LDCs with small to low capacity in renewable energy? Deborah? Is Deborah with us? Okay, um, let's then go back to Matt. I have a question here for you. Um, 
1.5. Could you elaborate a bit in which sector technical innovation is more relevant and where lifestyle behavior changes are more important? And are you also considering the short and long-term actions and reductions that are required? Um, Matt, would you want to speak to this? Sure. Um, and thank you very much for your question, Soren, if I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, so indeed, uh, technical innovation. So, so first of all, let me state that obviously deep mitigation cuts are required across sectors. And, and as stated in the presentation, um, sort of the power sector is the most obvious and, and frankly easiest um, to, to mitigate in first. Uh, there are other sectors uh, where technical in, uh, te technolo technolo technological innovation, excuse me, um, is, uh, is required. And these are sectors um, largely including, for example, uh, cement production, iron and steel production, um, uh, some chemical production. So this is all uh, industrial emissions or industrial processes. Um, but then also as well as some of our uh, longer haul transportation uh, mechanisms. Um, and that's both long haul aviation, uh, international shipping, um, as well as freight. And there are technical solutions to all of these, but um, the, so there's a question to the degree that they can be ramped up and the need for the, the degree to which they're needed is also related to behavioral change. And that's the second part of your question. Um, we've seen some of this behavioral change actually already in the pandemic. So we, for example, we are not sitting in New York together today, right? Um, that doesn't mean that we should cancel all international meetings, but to the degree that travel can be reduced and we can go more to internet media, um, that's one of the things that we can do. Um, but behavioral change also will be important um, in our everyday lives. So uh, for example, uh, meat consumption actually produces a significant amount of methane, uh, which is a non-CO2 greenhouse gas. Um, people focus a lot on CO2, but when we get to, to net zero, or as, as Claire mentioned, net zero means net zero greenhouse gases, including all of these other greenhouse gases. Um, so the place where um, behavioral shifts are required are going to be more about, uh, uh, indeed, you mentioned diet shifts, but also personal behavior with respect to, to, to transport, um, to energy consumption, and, and other things, uh, consumption in general. So thank you very much for your question. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Bill, I have another provocative question here for you. It says, from the presentations, I understand that reaching 1.5 is possible if we take the right path. What are the honest possibilities of this happening? Some of the literature I have come across say that it is less than 3%. And there's a reference here to literature from one Cox et al, published in 2018. And Bill, do you want to respond to this? Yeah, thanks, Leon. Yeah, look, uh, very good question. Let's start out with the Cox paper first, which is a paper about the equilibrium climate sensitivity. In other words, what happens to the climate system in the, in the very long run if you increase CO2 concentrations. And the point about 3% uh, chance of, um, of uh, the equilibrium climate sensitivity under one and a half degrees doesn't really apply to the question of can we limit warming to one and a half degrees. It's a statement about the theoretical climate sensitivity in the long run lying under uh, one and a half degrees is only 3%, very different issue. Um, e even if the climate sensitivity is a bit at the higher end uh, of what is shown in the Cox paper and indeed subsequent research, uh, the emission pathways uh, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees would still get us there because we have uh, emissions reaching zero and then negative, which will tend to uh, first stop the warming and then begin to reduce it. Um, so we won't really expose the climate system to uh, the region where you could expect climate sensitivity itself to begin increasing. So the short answer is um, so, uh, physically, geophysically, with emissions going down, uh, we can still get to one and a half degrees. The bigger question is a political one. Will the world, as big as it is, as complex as it is, uh, get on to make the right kinds of policies and choices that will move uh, our energy system, agriculture system in the right direction. Uh, 
that's a question that each of us can answer for ourselves. I mean, my own feeling is that uh, there's a lot of hope out there, as you've seen from this presentation, the European Union is moving forward, China's moving forward. If Biden, uh, candidate Biden wins the US election, nearly half of global emissions are covered by the big emitters with a, with a, a zero emission target for mid-century. It gets us a long, long way towards the one and a half degree pathway. It's a very good start. Um, that's my feeling anyway. Okay, thanks very much, Bill. Deborah, um, I see you've resolved your technical question um, problems. There's a question here for you. What of what has been shown is applicable for less developed countries with small to no capacity in renewable energy? Deborah? Um, yeah, I hope you can hear me now. Um, yes. So as, as I've indicated, I, I think I'm, I'm, Bill has already touched a little bit on that. Um, so as I've indicated, the, the there's multiple benefits when it comes to sustainable development. And one that um, goes directly to benefiting the least developed countries and the cities. It's, it's an example that I gave earlier in terms of energy security and independence. You have most of these LDCs basically dependent on, 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 on um, fuel imports, for instance. Um, and if they were to implement renewable energy um, in, the, in their countries, that creates an opportunity for them to become energy independent and not rely, for instance, on, on foil imports um, as just one example. But also overall contributing to the overall um, economic, uh, economic growth. There's an analysis that was undertaken, for instance, in 2018 that shows that low carbon development could deliver at least um, uh, in the region of uh, around 26 trillion economic benefits globally by 2030. And I think um, that's, that's a huge amount of money that most uh, developing countries could benefit from. Hey, thanks. And there were a very quick follow up for you also. You yeah. referenced uh, project key gaps and support Paris compatible pathways. Um, yeah. Someone is asking when are the country specific um, pathways expected to be made available? Yeah, um, I think so. Uh, the, that last slide, it's yeah, it's only one slide because of the time constraints. So the, the project is basically way bigger than what I had introduced. Uh, and it was just an introduction in terms of the the national pathways and the sectoral pathways. There's other components as well to the project that also looks at LULUCF pathways and the power sector investment requirements. So in terms of the plan, uh, we will be producing um, the majority of the national pathways this year, not 100%, not that is not all 68 of them this year. Some of them will only come in next year. Um, and then when it comes to sectoral pathways, we have started sectoral breakdown, for instance, into energy industry, waste and agriculture. And we plan to do more detailed breakdown into, for instance, transport, residential, and power later in the year. However, most of these results will be, will be presented next year. And you'll continue to hear a, a, a lot about uh, the IKEA project as, as during the course of the project. So we, we've had two seminars early this year, and then we plan to have more interactions and outreach with stakeholders. But yeah, watch the space for it. Okay. Thanks very, very much. Um, and we have so many other interesting questions, but we've run out of time, unfortunately. So can I ask Bill, as, as the CEO of Climate Analytics, Bill, would you want to make a few closing comments as we bring this webinar to an end? Yeah, thanks, Leon. Um, and thanks for everyone um, who has joined uh, the webinar. Uh, uh, a large number of interesting questions and a very interesting audience I see from the list. So thanks uh, for joining this climate analytics uh, virtual event. I'm sorry once again not to be in New York um, uh, for this uh, ourselves. I wanted to thank uh, the climate analytics team who has presented this uh, for the enormous amount of work they've done over the last weeks, um, including over the last weekend to get this uh, rich um, uh, and complex presentation uh, uh, and information into shape. And, and thank you, Leon, uh, for joining us from Grenada to facilitate this. And thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming and stay safe. Bye.